Oh wait, I've lost the clicker. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Bagley. I'm the nurse practitioner that works in the headache clinic at the U. Been here since 93. So I'm excited to talk a little bit. Come on in, don't worry. Come and sit on this side because I'm going to try and focus my attention here, not at the camera. No panic. That's just the noise in the background of the door for the people online. <laughs> You're fine. So tonight's goal was just from an idea of, since I talked last, it was before the release of Amavig. It was just kind of coming out. And I thought it would be nice to review the fact that now we have three drugs that have come out. And also to really talk about what else is coming in the pipeline, because there's, I think, the excitement about having an explosion, if you will, of new opportunities in treatment of headache, what else is happening, and kind of review what we've learned so far. I think in clinical practice, talk a little bit about what we learned from the clinical studies, um, because I think that helps put things in perspective. What we see in clinical trials, does it really apply to what I see just in my own practice, because I think that helps. Um, and just review a little bit about what we know in migraine itself. I think the almost 30 plus years I've been doing headache has some hopefully validity in the world of headache. Um, but I think that helps because trials are one area that <clears throat> I think people get confused sometimes of why we look at headache in one direction, how it feels to you as the patient who has headache. It doesn't always fit the perfect box. Um, but what I really appreciate about how all of the clinical trials were run is that these are not patients who did only who only experienced a few headaches in their lives and so kind of what I what I thought about is how we think about what the goal was for tonight I thought first if we look at you know what are the medications we know that are approved um, what are in the pipeline um, what's coming um, for also what's happening in the world of cluster because this is also not a big population of people. Typically it's a man's headache when it comes to the gender of cluster. And sometimes people get confused that they think they have cluster because the brain is sometimes coming in clusters is very different than the diagnosis of cluster. And also talk about clinical trials and what those look like. So um, for most people who are experienced migraineurs, they know about Amovig or Arenumab. And on all of these drugs, you'll see a dash and four letters. They have zero meaning other than to the FDA, who required each company to have this little extra add-on so that in the future, when these become generic, they will be identified beyond Arenumab <clears throat> and the four additional letters. So it doesn't mean that it has a special extra um, chemical makeup or anything else. That's just these little identifiers that you'll see. So it came out on May 17th, 2018. The phones were ringing like crazy. Um, <clears throat> that was released in two separate dosages, 70 milligrams and 140 milligrams only available as an auto injector as a 70 milligram dose. So if you, go, if you use the 140, it is two injectors of that pin. Um, the biggest side effects that were reported were, were uh, two things, right? Redness at the injection side or pain and then constipation. This drug has the mechanism that is a complete receptor blocker. So for those of you who understand a little bit of this mechanism of CGRP. So calcitonin gene-related peptide. This is a protein. This is a easily available peptide or protein that has most um, free release, if you will, or availability in the jugular venous system. It uh, also has a large availability within the trigeminal uh, uh, system in the brain. And it is elevated in migraine. So back in the 90s, this was a well-known problem in migraine. And there was a lot of physiology and a lot of work done surrounding CGRP. When they gave people CGRP, they got a migraine. 
So it's not a secret that this has been a big component of migraine. There was work around it in the early days. Um, there were drugs that were created and actually close to release back in the early 2006-07 era. They had problems that created liver disease and they were not able to get to the market. And so back to the drawing board. And that is why these drugs became what we know as monoclonal antibodies. And so antagonists. So they antagonize the protein so it can't so it binds, so it can't be released. With this, it was pretty exciting because it's an injection. It's a big molecule. It degradates within the body, so it doesn't hit the liver, doesn't hit the kidneys, doesn't interact with other drugs. And that is why your triptans or other drugs you use to treat headache doesn't have implications or interactions. So that's what happened. In the clinical trials, they studied both episodic migraine we, d we define episodic migraine for the clinical purposes of clinical trials as 4 to 14 headache or migraine days per month. And then chronic migraine is 15 days or greater. Eight of those days had to be migraine with migraine pain and symptoms lasting four hours or greater during those days. So I think this is important, as you all know, being migraineurs, that a migraine is typically a pain that lasts four hours or greater with light or sound sensitivity. It has associated features of nausea and or vomiting, usually one-sided, pulsatile, worse with activity. So, you know, you think about the stomach's effect. Why, why do people get nauseated? Because the gut stops absorbing. Usually some people will sometimes say, I always feel better if I puke. So you think about those features that come with a headache. So we have to have that definition of migraine to be a candidate. So it's interesting when you think about when I said that these patients in the clinical studies were not what I would say virgin migraineurs. The average patient in these studies, and this is true for the next two drugs I'm going to talk about, generally had an average of two decades history of headache. So they also were about 40 year old Typically women, at least 85% of the people in the studies, women, generally demographically white. So I generally say these are kind of look like Utah population of patients, right? Because that's kind of the people I see in Utah. But also they had been exposed probably to at least one migraine preventive as well. The episodic trial, maybe people not quite as much migraine preventives. More chronic migraine people had probably been on at least one or maybe two failed preventives. Some people had been on Botox as well. If they had been on Botox in the studies for the chronic migraine trial specifically, they had to have been washed out or uh, not on Botox for at least four months before the study as well. So there was no overlap in the trials. So I think just to give you perspective, these people were pretty committed to be able to give something a try, right? And so we, we learned this from this clinical trial. Within this study, they had response rates that were fairly robust. So about 50% of the patients had about 50% response rate of reduction of migraine headache days. Now you have to think about that in months about four to six in the episodic migraine trial because it was a six month trial. The chronic migraine trial only went three months. So those response rates were closer to only about 30% of 50% reduction. So clearly because we can make assumptions, right? It, was, it didn't go as long. So we didn't have as much time to get fewer headache days if they had an average of 18, 19 headache days per month, we're just not going to see that much reduction overall. There were super responders. We can't make much assumptions from that information yet, but we know that over time, they have open label information that we can get from the literature now that looks like the longer people are on drugs, the better they get over time. In general, we see clinically, I see, have seen clinically, a good six months worth of data tells us the longer they're on drug, they, they tend to get better. I would think, I mean, I would say personally, and again, this is personal experience, this isn't what the drug companies are saying. If you're seeing response by six months, stay on it. If you're probably not, then I would probably say it may be time to consider something different. And so that's kind of where that would come from at this point, too. So that's, that's one drug. It's been out the longest. So for my experience, that's what I'm seeing clinically. Now the next drug we got was 
a Jovi or Fremenuzumab. And you'll see again this lovely VFRM. Furfum, I don't know. You guys can think about what you want. So it came out in October. It's, an, it's another unique piece of information that you'll see here. Either 225 milligrams every 30 days, or the patients have the option of doing all three injections all at once and doing it every three months. So this drug, unlike the last drug that works on all the receptors, works on what we call the ligand. So I use the analogy, it might be oversimplified. Everybody can get in the house, one can get in the house through the door, and one can get in the house through the window, right? You're still gonna block CGRP, it's just a different mechanism to do that. Um, this one has side effects of injection site redness, sometimes different um, pain, in duration, what we call redness, hardness, different things. And again, these had what we call the HALO trials, episodic migraine and chronic migraine. Episodic migraine, longer trials, because again, you have to remember, when we're looking at people who don't have as many headache days per month, we have to go longer to actually look at the efficacy and the safety data. In the chronic migraine trial, we're just trying to say, do we reduce the number of headache days over time, and is it safe? So similar structure, similar amount of patients, same attention, and again, reduction of headache days over time and 50% reduction. So I don't want to belabor every, tr every study, every trial, <clears throat> and we're still seeing patients getting response, getting benefit from these drug trials, <clears throat> as we have seen with the first drug as well. And then the third drug that we have now had out since <coughs> September, <clears throat> so this one came out, excuse me, I did it alphabetically, Amovic, Ajovi, Imgality, no favorites included here. Um, and I guess I could have done it by, sorry, FGA, I don't know, did I do it? I'm, I did it alphabetically by, I don't know, it doesn't matter, I'm on tape, regardless. Um, so galcanuzumab, GNLM, <laughs> is dosed with a 240 milligram loading dose the first month and then just 120 milligrams every 30 days after that. This one is also what we call a ligand. And so you can also see injection site reactions but no other mention of constipation and again likely because it's not a complete receptor blocker. This also has data with the episodic migraine trial and chronic migraine trials as well. There are some open label uh, extension data as we have also seen with both HOV and with Amavig. The longer people are staying on drug that's being published, the longer they get further reduction of migraine days. I think this, we see this with other drugs that we've been on in the past that have not been migraine specific, but at the same time, getting ahead of the game, the less people have chronic migraine or frequent migraine, the less likely we repeat these patterns. I think one of the issues of um, patients who have a lot of headache, the problem we see is the likelihood of getting from an episodic or high frequency episodic headache and getting into chronic headache. That's the problem, right? Is how do we prevent that component to get to chronic because it's much harder to stop a chronic headache. And for those people in the audience or online who know that that's the really tough ticket and how do we break that? I mean, that's probably for my job is the hardest one to battle because we can get certain points of like, okay, you're down a certain number of days, great, but we really want to flip that number of, you know, 12 headache days a month or 16 headache days a month to four or six headache days per month. And how do we get that brain's calibration? The tough thing is, and I think the reality, is many things cause headache and cause migraines. So this is a terrific breakthrough in all of my world of doing headache. I mean, 25 years ago, I call it the silver anniversary. 25 years ago, we had the breakthrough of Imitrex, right? When it hit the market and it was the first thing we really had that was specific in breakthrough for treating migraine to abort a headache. It was wonderful. It changed people's lives. And it's taken 25 years to get a very specific migraine preventive drug to market. And so you think about that bookend of time that it's taken. What I'm excited about now is that we finally have like more, I think, substantiation for patients, for clinicians like me, 
that validates the science that migraine is real. I mean, I don't need to tell patients, I feel like I need to tell more clinicians, like, it's the real deal, guys. But at the same time, how to help people feel hope that there's more to come. And I think that's what's exciting because this is like scratching the surface, that there's more of this. It's, it's that CGRP is one component, again, just like serotonin, the 5-HT1B1D receptors of tryptans is another component of treating migraine, but there's more to it. This can't help necessarily when the barometric pressure drops that that's necessarily gonna totally impact CGRP and that's why you get a bad migraine when the storms fall. Or what happens when the menstrual associated migraines hit when estrogen falls. So we still have, you know, I, I tell people, it is like the Jenga puzzle. You pull a piece out, you get a bad migraine. There's many things that still happen that one thing, it's not just a one hit wonder, but it certainly has impact on all the other parts that play into it. So. For me, it's the excitement of being a clinician, treating patients like you all, and knowing there's still more to happen, and hopefully for more generations coming down the pipeline that will have more things to offer. So the next drug that's coming is still one of the CGRP monoclonal antibody antagonists. It's going to be an IV infusion likely every three months. So just last month, they put in their application to the FDA. So this is a lot, pardon me, a lot of words, but it looks like the first quarter of 2020 is when it will become available. And these slides will be on the headache website too. So calm down, I can see you typing stuff. <laughs> Little OCD girl. Um, <laughs> I know who you are. Um, but again, it will be there for another place in treatment that maybe something will be different about its mechanism than the shots and the injectables. So another, another place in, in treatment for headache. Now, we move on to something else that's coming down the pipeline, and that is another group of drugs that are going to be oral CGRP drugs for prevention. So these are in the pipeline. When we talk about clinical trials, phase three is when we're actually testing patients for the efficacy. So phase two is really about safety. Can we use these drugs? Are they safe? Are they gonna hurt people, et cetera? So you can see now, your, your Brojapant by Allergan is in its second positive phase three trial for prevention. Another one is Atojapant by Allergan, which has had a 2B and a three, uh, phase three for prevention and they're doing some active enrollment in this trial. Um, we're not part of any of these trials currently at the U. And then Remedjapant by Biohaven is another one. So what you can see is they're trying to refine oral agents as well. Not everybody's crazy about shots. We don't know what, obviously, cost is gonna look like, but hopefully, again, oral agents can hopefully become easier to produce, a lot less expensive, more access. What do we know? 36, 38 million Americans have migraine. How do we make treatment accessible? How do we make it realistic for people? So I think this is a, just another statement about where are we going. Yes, it still has the mechanism behind, P, uh, behind CGRP, but it's another therapy for people. Something else that you'll notice, both of those drugs that were in the previous slide for prevention are also being studied for acute abortive therapy as well. So another process by which the smaller molecule to treat migraine abortively. What do you mean by abortive? So for rescue. So in the same, men, uh, same thought as using it for like a triptan it would be. So when you get a headache, you abort the headache. So, okay. Now a newer one coming out even sooner though is a drug called lasmitidam. This is a drug that Lilly has um, submitted to the FDA just in November of 2018. Uh, so when I mention the tryptans, they work on selective receptors of serotonin. 5-HT1B, which are the blood vessels, and 1D, which is the neurochemistry of the migraine. So vasoconstriction, right? So a lot of people that have had history of heart problems or uncontrolled high blood pressure, stroke, are not candidates to get that drug. This is what we call a 5-HT1F. So no vasoconstrictive properties. So it, it does hopefully land itself in a safety profile, 
for those patients who haven't been able to have a very specific migraine drug and have been caught in the catch-22 of taking pain pills and other things that we really try to avoid because that can perpetuate sometimes migraines. And so we have that coming for another population of people, hopefully at the end of the year. So again, super exciting because we have more things coming out. So why do I get excited? Because there's more things to offer patients. Now, I mentioned that there's going to be some other options for patients who have cluster. So, cluster, so a cluster diagnosis occurs in men seven to one than in females. It comes with features that we talk about with autonomic dis dysfunction. So runny eye, runny nose, flushing face. This is not a headache that you want to go to bed with. This is what we talk about. They pace, they get facial edema or swelling. It's terrible. It can last 15 minutes up to 180 minutes. It has a seasonality to it, so it can be fall or spring, can awaken them from their night sleep. It may require, so high flow oxygen can actually abort the headache. Injectable sumatriptan can. Can be episodic, but it can come as a chronic cluster. It's also known as the suicide headache, if you've ever heard of that term. So it's very devastating. Um, I, I also say that this is one of those headaches that may take up to seven clinicians before the patient actually gets the right diagnosis. They may think they have a sinus infection. They might get their teeth pulled. Men don't always go to the doctor, so they often don't get the right diagnosis anyways. They're impulsive. It's maybe part of why it's a suicide headache as well, but it's dreadful, and when you see a patient who has it, it's really an awful sight. So this is actually put on the fast track by the FDA because we have so few treatments for them, and this made um, first pass for episodic cluster. So it's really exciting that we have something really specific to offer them. And so galcanuzumab was um, granted that. So that's really, really cool. And it just got through the first pass with the FDA for Fast Track last week. So this is like late breaking news, you guys. Just saying. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about when I think people are curious about what in the heck is going on in treatment of headache and what are we doing? And you know, it's one of those things that you know, is often, I think, undervalued as a diagnosis. And what can you do in your own world? I mean, we just, February came back from headache on the hill in Washington DC to rally our you know state senators about you know spending more money and and looking at treatment of headache as a really significant disabling disorder and this is when we try to get funding and really look at this and so clinicaltrials.gov is a public website that will tell you all of the different clinical trials that are being done both in America and other countries, but you can actually go to, go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can put in United States, you can put in Utah, and you can actually search all of the clinical trials done being done in Utah. You can search by active enrollment, by completed trials. So I think it's kind of nice for you to be able to see what is happening. Um, there's about, I think, 10 right now. So there's a... Um, there's some that are being done in kids that are looking at some of the triptans being looked at for children. So, because I think that's also really tough when we have, you know, we see our young children who start to have bad headaches and what are we going to do for them? As I said, next generations not trying to grow into being chronic migraineurs. It's a really tough tragedy when we see adolescents being so ill and sick. And, you know, I think that's part of the gratitude we have for part of why we have headache school, right, is to the Daniel Byron Foundation. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy that Dr. Dan, Dan Henry's daughter suffered. So I think part of why we're all here again is to remember that this is, you know, a big lifespan of an illness. So this is a really wonderful site, I think, when we start getting to wonder what's being done. This is some areas that we get some funding. And yes, it's from pharma, but we also look at NIH funding that's happening. So it is good because you can look by disease, you can look by, is it migraine, is it face pain, is it trigeminal neuralgia, like where's all, this, where's all the money going or isn't going? So you look at epilepsy, there's tons of money in epilepsy. So migraine itself is a fraction of the money that's being spent in healthcare dollars to study it, but there is some. I like to talk about what are we doing here at the U. So we have the MOTS trial, that's the medication overuse treatment uh, group and that's basically it's a very interesting study. It's a study that's being done 
through um, the Mayo Scottsdale that is looking at patients who overuse their rescue medications. It's a randomized trial that um, basically with kind of a randomization, as I would say, that the patient is enrolled if they're overusing any analgesics or triptans, that they take the risk, for lack of a better term, to um, stop taking their medications without any other change. And then they get placed on another preventive uh, to see how it goes. Um, and, and there's kind of a, there's a protocol for it, obviously. But then um, by the addition of uh, treatment, the preventive-wise, and there's a protocol for what the preventive is, to see how they do, and then they do a daily diary. The other way to do it is not stop abruptly and then just get put on a preventive and then see if coming off of it slowly makes a difference. What's helpful about studies like this is this is real time, right? So the patients basically do a patient reported outcome and do they do okay? Do they not do okay? Do they think it's terrible? Does it really, is it really awful? Yes. I mean, so what we really want to know in patient outcome studies is what does this really look like versus what are we saying this hap what happens to patients? And so We've been doing this for a couple of, almost two years now, I think. So that's really helpful. The Arbor study, we have, I believe we have some pamphlets out front too. This is um, really a huge database for the first time that we're, a, and we just became a part of it. There's about 11 sites now, I believe. I misquoted, you can look it online. Um, but it's a registry that you can become a part of, keeping a diary, and that we can now gain access um, within our institution that will allow us to see what's happening with patients, what medicines you take, what your headaches like. We can get a bio sample of your blood that doesn't get shared with any identifying factors. But again, another way that we can start to gain knowledge about our patients and what is the disorder that you have. And so, you know, another way to just gain more, um, I think, knowledge about what is this disorder because it has so many variables that it's not, it's not like taking a radiograph or an x-ray of a broken arm and then saying, that's your problem, we're gonna put you back together and you're good to go. Like, the brain is too complex, the person is too complex, and all the variables that come with it really set itself apart to be a very different disorder. And then the last one you'll see is the thin um, film spectacles that Dr. Brad Katz at the Moran Eye Center is doing on children and adolescents with light sensitivity. He's done a few other studies with photosensitivity in adults as well. It's been very interesting when we look at light sensitivity in migraineurs, they tend to have actually more disabling dis disease, if you will, than people who have eye disease. So we know that people who have migraine really suffer greatly from the disturbance of lights and how much more they're affected because of their migraine. And this just goes back to what we all know that when you have headache, and even if you don't have headache, but how much more disturbing the lights are and really sounds and smells and everything else because you have such a sensitive brain that comes with all of those things that it really triggers and sort of fires up the brain that when you have one thing going, something else on top of it, it's kind of like the kindling effect. It just really aggravates so much more that, you know, you, it's like you stub your toe and you have a little bit of pain, but then you like smash your finger, then you have more pain, and by gosh, you already have a headache. So it's like, you know, there, for those of us that are a little older, you know, the, you know the commercial, Calgon, take me away? We can all appreciate that, right? So yeah, it's tough. So our brains just really have a harder time with that capacity to control that. So these thin spectacles are this coating to kind of take down that noise of our brain being irritated. That's what he's studying as well, so. And I think that's really kind of all of my just updates currently that's happening. There was a question that came in earlier to me um, from a patient that couldn't come tonight asking about um, procedures. Are there any new implants or procedures? And there's been nothing new since 2016. There, they had looked at occipital nerve stimulators and some other things, but there haven't been any devices, implantable devices, or anything else FDA. So I just wanted to make sure I covered that question for the group in case that was going to come up as well. So that's, that's all I have, unless you guys have questions. The, um, the protein with our yeah, the protein with that 
The CGRP? CG, okay, that's what I was. Yeah, so calcitonin gene-related peptide is a protein itself, right? Isn't it like an amino acid? So, yeah. I couldn't remember. That's okay. You'll get the slides. Are there any questions online, Lauren? Anyone? Bueller? So, and then the, the, all those other... Um, the pants? Your, ad, your, your brad, broja pants? Yes. The, so the all of, they're all trying to connect to the, that. Right, so, so when we talk about something that's called an antagonist, they're trying to block it, right? So an agonist tries to synergize it and enhance it, and antagonist is trying to block it. Right. So from it being released. Mm -hmm. Well, it's already released, so we have tons of CGRP everywhere. Oh, okay. And so it's all trying to block it specifically within the trigeminal vascular system, yeah, which is in the brain where the migraine occurs, right? Okay. And so the monoclonal antibody, which is the synthesized version of these injections, is why those are created in the lab and that have to be the shot and have to be probably more expensive than everything because they have to be super, you know, super drugs, whereas the newer ones are not going to be monoclonal antibodies or biologics. These are going to be, these are being created to not have the problems with the liver. So just to be clear, we had some of the other class of drugs that were known with an ending or a suffix called pants in the past, in about 2007. And they were studied and they were very effective to rescue a headache. And then the problem came when they tried to use them as a daily drug and people had liver problems. And so they did not make it to the market. And so that's why now, and those were smaller molecules, and so they've gone back and recreated the, the molecule itself to avoid the liver, the liver pass. Well, or still goes through the liver, but without the, the hiccup of the liver problems. So all those ones after Amos mm -hmm. uh, all those... The Ubrojapant, Rimagent, yep, Atrojapant, yep. So those are all similar to... Are they considered similar to Amos or...? So they're all going to orally block the protein. Um, well, I guess the, all the ones that I, I noticed that they have like an injection. The so... AJOV yeah. and Emgality, those that are already available, yeah. yes, those are already made in monoclonal antibodies, yes. So like I said, you can still get in the house, one goes through the door, two go through the window. Okay. That makes sense? I can talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Three drugs became available this year as injections to prevent migraine in the same class. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that help? Yep. Okay. Any? So I don't know which one to pick on the three that came out. Oh, it's such a great question. Wouldn't, wouldn't the drug companies love me to answer that? Um, I, 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 I am from a drug company. Yeah. So. Full disclosure. Yeah. So I think for me, clinically, right, I mean, when we only had one to pick from and everybody wanted to be on a medication, I mean, we had one, right? Um, and I think, I think clinically for me, I look at patient, a lot of patient preference. Some of it is they don't want to look at a needle to shoot themselves. That a lot of people do not want to see a needle. Some patients have terrible constipation already. We're not necessarily going to, and I see that clinically with the first drug we talked about. That can really make things worse. And so for those reasons, I don't go that, there. So I mean, some, some of it's a little bit easy. I think from a standpoint of saying, what's my clinical gestalt right now? I don't have a big jump on my impression other than like wait and see. I think the bigger question that we don't have answered because none of these drugs, just so everyone knows, have ever been compared in a head-to-head -head trial. They all did their own trials. They all had a little bit similar but different outcomes. So just to be fair, right? I mean, that's how we have to say, well, we have close, you know, approximations of what they look like, but this is what we know. Um, and so I think part of it is 
what, you know, what does the patient phenotype look like? What have we seen? Are there enough nuances within a clinical trial that would say, gosh, these patients tried and failed this class of drugs, or they did well on this class of drugs, they're going to do well on this. We don't have that. So I feel for me, I'm keeping personally a list of everybody I put on which drug they do. And then I have looked from the phenotype to say, I'm so surprised they've done this well on drug X, and I can tell you there isn't one similar pipeline yet that I can put that product in a, in a bucket and say, those people are the people that are going to do great on this drug. I need probably two years for that. And I have probably written between all of my patients, you know, 200 prescriptions so far. And so I don't have that answer. I'm waiting for it, I will tell you. I'm, and then really I'm basing things on patient feedback, patient exposure, and waiting to see. Yeah. Have, have you tried the same patient on two of those, I guess, different new drugs? Is there enough time for that? Like if, if the so this is another great question. Working, okay. Is it worth to try the next? Or so let me clarify for people who are online, if they're still there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question is, has there been enough time if somebody, if I can clarify what I think you're saying. Has there been enough time if somebody has failed drug one to move to drug two? Yes. And there is no specific guideline on how much time to wait to move from drug one to drug two. Most of these, well, I will say these drugs have about what we call a 30-day half-life. When we talk about half-lives of drugs to go through a body system, it's usually five half-lives, which means typically you would say five months to clear out. There are people in the certain places of the world that say they give their patients about a month to wash out, if you will. Um, my personal clinical preference, and this is not based on anything other than there's been a position paper through other uh, companies who have biologics that are on a different trajectory that have used a window of three months and so that is what I'm using. So I wait three months to move a patient to a different trial, to a different drug. So there is, I mean, again, this is not a pharma, you know, a pharma drug talk at all, so I'm not representing any drug company. Um, there's also been some disclosure from patients, and these are just merely anecdotal patient reports who feel that at about day 26 they feel a wear off effect of drug. This is just conversational stuff and information from a conversation, right? But clearly we know the drug isn't out. So the, again, we have all of this time to see. So I think patients do a lot of blogging and feedbacking and that there's a this and there's that. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm safe in my practice, do a best practice, my most comfort is, you know, trying to shoot for that three-month window of transition of time. So again, as you can see, the other two drugs, September, October, you know, clearly waiting, time to get people on drug, move off. So, and I, I also think that we have to be thoughtful about what are expectations. And I think I've tried in my practice to be careful about you know, you get a patient on a drug and they see super responders and, oh, I don't have any more headaches or, gosh, you know, you have to remember that when people had 50% reduction, that was for one of their months of the drug trial, not for all of the months of the trial. And so knowing some of these data points isn't that, well, I had a really good month and then I had a really bad month, so it must not be working anymore. So just always being very cautious about the finer lines in between the studies. And so, you could have a really bad month because winter is always a bad month. That's not going to mean it doesn't work. And so giving things enough time is always important because you could literally blow through the three drugs very quickly and then be done, right? So while we're waiting for more things to come, then what? So I don't know. I'm sort of conservative, try to be rational about approach. So. Okay, I guess that's it. I do have a question. Yes, how can I help you? Rebound headaches. Yes. Does everybody suffer from rebound headaches? Or 
are there people who don't? Thank you for asking that question. The question is, does everybody suffer from rebound? I will tell you that there are people who maybe don't get headache at all that eat what we would call potential drugs for rebound who maybe have back pain and take Norco every day and never get a headache. And then you would say, well, how is that possible? So what I would say is there are people who have propensity to get headache that have a sensitive brain who it doesn't take much to trigger rebound headaches. And so um, the ability to get a headache. So when we talk about more than 10 days of a simple analgesic, excedrin, aspirin, ibuprofen, more than 12 days of a triptan, those are things that can precipitate you into a headache. I think what's hard is when we say, well, if you have a bad headache and you take your two triptans in a day, so it's not necessarily the number of triptans, but the days you use the triptan. So that's another, again, the fine line of, is it number of doses or number of days? You have to be careful. Um, but in my 30 years of clinical practice, most patients who have migraine have a slippery slope of getting into medication overuse or rebound headaches. Yeah, and it's tough, right? Because we, we for a long time didn't want people to wait until their headache is really, really bad because if they get too far out the gate, it's harder to treat the headache. But then we also say, well, you know, if you treat when it's mild, you can shut it down. But then you get so nervous that if you wait too long, you're not going to get ahead of it, right? And so we've kind of talked out both sides of our mouth for 20 years because of that. Because in the early clinical trials, what we found in the world of the FDA rules for treating and, and evaluating effectiveness of a, of a drug is that you have to have a two-point window for a drug to show effectiveness for, for um, acute treatment. So you have to be at least at a moderate pain to go to zero pain or severe pain to go to mild pain on a pain score. So you have to go from a two to a zero or a three to a one. But what we learned in what we call protocol violators is if they treated their pain as mild and it went to zero, they were pain-free at 24 hours much longer for some people than if they treated it mild or, mo or moderate or severe. So we learned that, hey, those people who screwed up on the trial actually got better quicker and longer. And so <laughs> it's a shame on them, but good for them, right? So that was kind of this paradigm shift of we should actually be, we are learning from these people. But then we also have this double-edged sword. So to answer your question, most people who are migraineurs run the risk of getting into rebound because of that. And so once you sort of run that gamut of three days per week, really maximum of having to rescue, that's that chronification zone, is that you go from, from episodic, slippery slope over to chronic. So that's why it's really close. And that's why we talk about being able to get on something for prevention early before you get over to that zone. And sometimes we don't have a very good explanation as to why people get, you know, can get away with it for a while and then all of a sudden you hit the switch and you're done in, right? Like it's, it's rough and it's really hard to send it backwards. So is a rebound headache the same as your regular headache or is there a difference? So it's mechanistically the same. My physiology is still part of the migraine, right? It's just a lower level, more of an underpinning of the current of headache. And, and typically, people can have a medication or a rebound headache as an underpinning and still get a whopper on top of it. Life is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you go Hawaii, it doesn't get better. <laughs> Rub it in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might know a little secret there. <laughs> yeah, but it, it I mean, because that's the physiology, right? It's still, it's still your beast of burden, and then it's more of it. 
So that's why I say like the lovely thing would be if it were just CGRP and we could block it and you're done, thumbs up. But there's more to the story. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Sorry. No free lunch. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you for the folks online.